Welcome. This webinar is being offered through Dairy Xnet, which is a national e-extension resource. My name is Kathy Lee. I'm an extension educator with Michigan State University, and I'll be today's moderator. The title of today's webinar is The Role of Nutrition in Reproduction. Let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Milo Wiltbank is currently a professor in the Department of Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Since joining the faculty at UW-Madison in 1991, he has, been, he has done research primarily in regulation of fertility and ovarian function in dairy cattle. He has more than 200 published scientific research publications during his career at UW. He is probably best known for his participation in the development, validation, and modification of timed AI protocols such as OBSYNC and double OBSYNC. Dr. Wiltbank also has trained scientists from around the world in his laboratory and has worked with scientists and veterinarians in many countries to develop programs that work in the unique situation that they encounter in their countries. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. It's a real honor to be able to be part of this webinar. So I've, um, I've got a number of authors here on this, uh, on this particular presentation because a number of us worked together on this. Really, uh, Randy Shaver, who's the final author, and I had started a number of years ago to, to start to do nutrition reproduction interactions. And it's been a great, um, a great collaboration, and we've been able to work with a number of other people, as you see from Brazil and from uh, University of Florida, and been able to do a number of things on this. But I still have... Uh, potential at the start of this talk because I think we're still um, evaluating this. These kinds of studies are not easy to do, as I hope you'll you'll see as we go through. But to try to get valid information on the benefits of nutrition and reproductive performance is still an ongoing um, area. There's our cow that uh, really has had. Uh, some reproductive problems over a number of years, we said the lactate and dairy cow had problems, but in the last few years, we've really have been improving quite dramatically, and I think you can see this on many dairies, uh, if you're going out to, to dairies, and really it's related to all these four different areas of, of uh, dairy cattle um, genetics, physiology, management, and nutrition. From a genetic standpoint, uh, really, genomics around selection of cows that are higher fertility. Um, reproductive management programs are now available that really drive service rate, and also not just drive service rate, they also improve fertility. And then we've got a lot of management changes we've made that have allowed better compliance, better cow comfort. Uh, AI skills are, of course, essential uh, for reproductive management. So what I want to try to do is deal with this question, what is the role of nutrition in improving reproductive efficiency in today's dairy herds? We're really improving quite dramatically our reproductive performance since about 2000. It's been coming up quite a lot due to probably multiple of these uh, particular um, factors. And I want to discuss how nutrition fits into these really good reproductive management programs. So I'm going to go with this type of an approach of where there's certain critical periods when nutrition can affect reproduction. So I'm going to try to deal with, again, this question, what's the role of nutrition in improving reproductive efficiency in today's dairy herds? So the first part, I'm going to go through the dry period, uh, really, and I'll, I'll try to show that the last three weeks in most of the studies, that's when uh, the dry period management has had quite an impact on, on subsequent reproductive performance. Then there's the early postpartum period, and actually the first three weeks of this early postpartum period are uh, being shown to have, be quite dramatic in their effects. Then we've got the one week before AI, which ends up being quite a critical time for growth of the follicle. And then we have effects of nutrition that are really on the pregnancy, and we're starting to see some of those effects. So I'm just going to start here with the dry period, and I want to look at one study that I was part of with Roberto Sartori and Jose Santos, and let's see if I can do these, can't do these. 
So a number of people, but Glamy Pontus was the, the main person. And it's about vitamin E and how vitamin E, what we were trying to do was to try to uh, improve a retained placenta. This is quite a problem on some uh, dairies, particularly in certain areas in, in the, of the world, and this was in Brazil that we did this particular study. And so we thought we could use vitamin E to be able to evaluate or be able to try to improve um, retained placenta and possibly reproductive performance. So this is what we did. We worked on three dairy farms in Brazil. Uh, they were, all of the dry cows were being fed on pasture. Cows received uh, this amount of, uh, I use a vitamin E per day, 280, 390, and 480 as part of the grain mix during the dry period. But when we measured the vitamin E concentrations in the blood, which is called alpha tocopherol, this was actually inadequate. It was less than 50% of the recommendations from NRC, and 53% of the cows had inadequate serum vitamin E. So how we did the study, it's kind of hard to do these nutrition reproduction studies, but in this case, how we chose to do it was actually give injections of vitamin E. That allows the animals to be in the exact same setting, and we can give the injections of vitamin E and are able to, to then alter the vitamin E status of those animals uh, while they're in the, on the same, uh, same pastures and in the same conditions as the other cows. So cows were either given nothing or 1,000 IUs of vitamin E at about three weeks, two weeks, or one week before expected calving. So here's the alpha tocopherol concentrations or the vitamin E amounts before calving. And what you can see is vitamin E, let me get the, vitamin E drops quite dramatically from about uh, three weeks before calving and drops down quite a lot. This is vitamin E going into the colostrum, as it says here. So how we did the experiment is, again, we gave, we gave three injections, one, two, three, on a weekly interval before calving. Now, this probably was not enough vitamin E uh, because we really didn't increase vitamin E significantly in the blood. But you're going to see we did have some impacts uh, with this. Obviously, in a practical situation, you might do feeding rather than these injections. But again, we did the injections so that we could, um, so that we could practically do the experiment in a valid in a valid way. Here's the probability of retained placenta. And you can see as alpha tocopherol concentrations go up, we have less likelihood of having retained placenta. So cows with lower vitamin E had a higher probability of retained fetal membranes. So what happened with the treatments? Well, first, uh, let me just do it this way. Uh, the retained fetal membranes, the retained placenta, was significantly reduced from 20% to 13.5%. Obviously, they had a problem with, with retained placenta, but again, that's probably because their vitamin E concentrations were low. And one really interesting thing that we found was stillbirth rate was dramatically reduced by supplementing vitamin E. So this suggests that stillbirth is also related probably to the placenta and probably to the vitamin E and immune status of the animal. So this was an intriguing result to us. We didn't have any effect. If you look down at the bottom, there was no effect. Let's see. How do I get that? Thing? Okay. No effect on... Oh, I can't seem to move my pointer. Anyway, no effect on milk production, as you can see at the bottom. Here is the reproductive performance, and okay, here we go. You can see days to first AI were not different. They were being, being uh, they were going through a timed AI protocol, but the conception rate, at, particularly when we did the pregnancy diagnosis at 62 days, the 31 day wasn't different, but at 62 days, it tended to be different, and the pregnancy loss was significantly different between the groups with vitamin E reducing the pregnancy loss quite a lot. And if we looked at the conception rates to all AI, it was significantly higher with the vitamin E. So that was the key result for related to reproductive performance. So somehow by supplementing vitamin E, we had both uh, reduced retained placenta, reduced stillbirth rate, and reduced pregnancy loss. 
and a somewhat improved fertility also. Now here's another study that I found, uh, which uh, was from University of Illinois, and Phil Cardoso uh, did an evaluation, a prepartum nutritional stra strategy, and it was a retrospective evaluation of seven previous studies uh, that were fed either controlled energy or high energy diets during the far off and close up dry period. The far off dry period uh, nutrition did not have an effect, but the close up dry period did. And I'll show those results. So these are the results from the controlled energy versus the high energy diet. The days to first AI were not different, but the days from calving to pregnancy uh, were um, were reduced by 10 days in the animals fed the controlled energy diet rather than the high energy diet. The body condition score loss was less, about 0.3 points. And uh, again, the NEL for the first uh, four weeks of lactation were not different. So you can see there was some better reproductive performance when they had a, a more controlled energy, a higher fiber diet during the dry period. So both of these studies, I think, make the argument that, that you can improve reproductive performance by altering or optimizing the nutrition during the dry period. For instance, supplemental vitamin E before calving reduced retained fetal membranes, reduced steel growth, and reduced pregnancy loss. And the dry period, um, again, uh, either the, the fiber or some of the components in the diet can alter calving and early postpartum physiology and subsequent nutrition. Now, um, I want to go on to the next part, and this is kind of based on this idea of where it takes a long time, about 60 days, for a follicle to grow from this primordial follicle when it's activated up through the preantral and antral stages and up to the point where it ovulates will release the oocyte and it will uh, then be fertilized and become the embryo. So following this whole thing, this is, has led to this idea that's been called the Brit hypothesis of where animals near the time of calving and, and after calving can have quite an impact. Their nutritional, uh, different alterations in their nutrition can have an impact on the oocyte and subsequently the embryo. So I want to try to show that uh, we've tested that in the last few years uh, with more extensive numbers than had been done before, and uh, we're able to look at this particular aspect of whether uh, nutrition during the early postpartum period has an impact on embryo quality. So here's the study. Uh, Paolo Carvalho was the, pr the first author. It's done with Paul Fricke and Randy Shaver and I as, as uh, the main faculty. And it's a really nice study. I'm not going to show all of it here. But what we did in this study is we did use the protocol called double off-sync. And you can see it has a lot of treatments. We do one off-sync to pre-synchronize animals, and then we do a second off-sync to set them up for the time to AI. Now, the nice thing about this protocol is it gets cows to be cycling. And one of the problems with nutrition during the early postpartum period, particularly when we have poor nutrition, is that a lot of the cows are not cycling. And so we wanted to look at reproductive effects independent of this aspect of, of anovular cows. And so that's, so we used this particular protocol. And what you can see is the body condition score right near the time of AI does impact fertility. Here's the impact if we use just off-sync, which again, it doesn't really induce cyclicity in the anovular cows as well as double off sync, about a thousand animals. And what you can see is that as animals get below 2.75 body condition score, they dramatically drop about half uh, the fertility to the protocol. Uh, we also did a trial of double off sync. And what you can see is the fertility is much higher with double off sync, and the effect of body condition score at the time of AI is still present but it's much less. It goes from about 50% when the animals are 2.75 body condition score or above to about 40% when they're below, uh, they're 2.5 or below. So again, we do get rid of some of the problems with anovular cows, but there seems to still be an effect of the body condition score at the time, even though it's much less than it is 
uh, in other situations. Here's an experiment, too, that I think you're really going to be interested in. Is there are about uh, 1,800, over 1,800 cows in this particular farm. They're all synchronized with double off-sync. And what we did in this particular study is we evaluated body condition score during the early uh, postpartum period. So in this case, we evaluated it at calving and at 21 days after calving. That's when most of the changes in body condition score happen. I'll show that in the next uh, slides, but again, calving to 21 days, and we evaluated the body condition score change during this time period. Well, about 42% of them lost body condition. About 36% maintained body condition score, again, between calving and 21 days. This was kind of unusual because everyone says they all lose body condition score, but when we use these improved dry period management uh, strategies, we seem to, to be able to maintain body condition score, and there are actually 22% of the animals that gained body condition score in these first 21 days after calving. So almost 50% of the animals had did not lose body condition, a little over 50% did not lose body condition score in this particular study. Here's how the fertility came out, and it's just incredible. The animals that gained body condition score had a really amazing fertility, and then it dropped down from there. This is at the 40-day pregnancy diagnosis, or the same thing at the 70-day pregnancy diagnosis. And uh, in subsequent studies that we've done with this, uh, we continue to have really high fertility in these animals that gain body condition. Maintaining body condition has generally come up, but these animals that lose body condition score, again, have, have reduced fertility uh, even to these optimized protocols. Now, this is the third experiment we did where we really tried to test that idea that I gave you at the first about the embryo. And so what we did in this experiment is we, we weighed the animals weekly after calving. And again, we then divided them into quartiles. So the first quartile had animals that you can see gained body condition. So the second yeah, here it comes up. So the first quartile had about a 4% gain in body weight. The, the second quartile had no change. Then we had a quartile that had about 4% loss of body weight. And then a quartile that lost, again, it's almost all happening in the first three weeks, but lost about 8% of body weight. So now we tested that hypothesis by superovulating the animals and looking at embryos. This is the only way we're able to get enough embryos to evaluate at this day seven time period to see if really that hypothesis is correct. Are there, in fact, effects of body condition score change, or in this case, body weight change, on the embryo quality? We had 560 embryos that we evaluated from these four different groups in this study. And here's how the data came out. Uh, the, the superovulatory response was identical or, or wasn't significantly different between the four quartiles. Again, this is the quartile that lost the most weight. This lost 4% of body weight, uh, maintained or gained body weight. Uh, the fertilization was not different, so they were fertilized at the same rate. But now, as we start to go down into the embryo quality, that's where the big differences come out. So you can see here, for instance, degenerate, almost 50% of the animals that had lost the body condition score had degenerate embryos, whereas in the other categories, it was usually around 20%. So we had a lot of degenerate embryos, really in support of that hypothesis that we were talking about of where the body weight changes early postpartum can affect subsequent embryo quality. You can see only about 50% of the of the embryos were quality score one or two, so the higher quality embryos, and about 80% were in the other groups. So there's quite a dramatic difference, and it's mostly for the animals that really lose a lot of body weight during the early postpartum period. Again, in this particular study, it was 8% of body weight. So in summary, cows that lose body weight during the first 21 days after calving had much lower embryo quality compared to cows that gain body weight. So this just pretty much summarizes it, 48% versus about 80% in these other categories. So um, 
One of the limitations to this type of study is that we didn't manipulate the cows into the body weight changes. We just let them divide themselves into groups. In other words, the animals that lost more body weight, they were, more, they were probably likely to have had some clinical or subclinical problems, and that's part of what's happening. And so we can't say for sure that the body weight change caused these problems, but again, there clearly is an effect when those animals they lose a lot of body weight, seem to, uh, they already have had their embryos degenerate, degenerate by the first week after they're bred. So we don't really know, is this really body condition score loss or is it early postpartum disease effects? All right, let's go on to some other periods, but uh, first I'll just summarize this period. Low body condition score in your time of AI reduces fertility. Uh, but this, this effect can be reduced by using protocols that induce ovulation, like double osmic, and in the anovular cows. Greater postpartum body condition score loss reduces fertility, the pregnancy per AI, due to effects on the early embryo, which is kind of a very intriguing concept. So again, the same type of thing, but we're going Instead of just this very early period, now we're going to this last week before, before AI, because that seems to be a very sensitive period. We have lots of different data on the hormonal effects in this period and uh, how they can cause embryos to degenerate again by seven days after, uh, after AI. So how long the follicle stays so the duration of follicle dominance can cause uh, dramatic effects on fertility. The progesterone environment during the follicle dominance, so when progesterone is low, we have a lot more degenerate embryos, probably because the oocyte that's ovulated is, has been overstimulated or has been affected. And are there nutritional effects? Well, this is something we've been interested in. We've tried in a lot of different ways to try to evaluate this. Uh, we think there are effects of, of insulin, and I'll try to show you that. Uh, we've done a couple of manipulative studies. I'll just show you uh, one data set that's more of an epidemiological type study. So how this study was done, it was to evaluate the association of the individual components of the diet on fertility traits of dairy cattle. So we were trying to go out into commercial dairies and get a feel for how much the changes in diet were having an effect on fertility. So we had complete diets, which is not the easiest thing to get in the field, we found out, and dairy comp backups to have all of the reproductive data and other traits on 50 dairy farms. So this, again, was done out in the field and compared then the diet components with the reproductive traits. So here's how the data came out. Again, these are the diets in 50 herds versus the reproduction records. So here's one dietary factor, the uh, MDF, the non-detergent fiber. And what you can see, it has a significant positive effect. So the higher the fiber, the better the pregnancy per AI at first AI. NFC was the most dramatic effect that we continue to see. So when we have very high non-fiber carbohydrate, that's a negative impact on fertility. Now, again, these two are pretty much kind of saying the same thing about the diet. But again, the high carbohydrate seems to be very much a negative for the percent of animals that will be pregnant on farms at 150 days, the pregnancy per AI at first AI, and the pregnancy per AI at all services. So this is our most dramatic effect, is really having too high of carbohydrates in the diet. And I think I show a a, a graph of that. Starch is the same type of thing. Again, a negative effect. And here's the uh, graph. You can see the R value here, the pregnancy per AI at first AI versus the NFC in the diet. And you can see the herds are not all on this line as you would, would uh, as you'd anticipate. But again, there's this negative effect as NFC goes up. There seems to be uh, reduced uh, pregnancy per AI at first AI. Uh, now, some of the other components we had, particularly one that we're really interested in, is this methionine. So we, we had a positive impact, it looks like, of fat 
on pregnancy per AI at first AI. Lysine, there was no effect, but methionine, percent of metabolizable protein, tended to have an effect on percent pregnant at 150 days, but didn't really have an impact on the pregnancy per AI at the 32-day pregnancy diagnosis. Well, what we found out is this methionine effect, as we've continued to follow up with manipulative studies, it seems to be impacting the pregnancy loss, and that's why we're seeing an effect on percent pregnant, but not on the 32-day preg check uh, results. So uh, before I go on to that pregnancy effect and look at that, uh, I'll just summarize this pre-AI, the one week before AI. Too high of carbohydrates in the diet reduces pregnancy per AI, and it looks from some of our manipulative studies it's due to an elevated insulin uh, concentration in the blood, and this seems to have a negative impact. Fat, and particularly polyunsaturated fatty acids, can improve pregnancy per AI based on a lot of different studies. And the thiamine in the diet seemed to improve reproductive efficiency, and we continue to see this effect in some of our manipulative studies. So I'm going to show you one of those at this time. So the one thing that some of these nutritional components can do is they can actually change the um, what we call the epigenomics. So they put groups on, particularly methyl groups, onto the DNA or onto some of the proteins, the histones that are part of the DNA. So they don't change the genetics, but they change what we call the epigenomics, and they're due to nutrition. So here's, here's the experiment we've done is really with methionine, and you can see methionine has this methyl group at the end, and this methyl group then can be attached to the DNA, and it actually turns off gene expression. Or it can be attached to the histones, and it really stops abnormal gene expression, at least if, if methionine is limiting and you get methionine to normal levels. There may be a point where it's, it's too high, but in general, it's, it seems to be a positive, and uh, again, it's probably because of some of these epigenomic effects, uh, potentially, of methionine. Here's the experiment we did. We had Holstein cows. They were milked twice daily. Cows were blocked by parity and randomly assigned to two groups. They either received lumen protective methionine uh, at 2.34% uh, of metabolizable protein, or the control diet had 1.87%. Now, let me show you how we did that, because to get this number of animals in a study is kind of difficult. So we worked on a commercial dairy, and this is the student that's doing the study, Mateus Toledo. And what he did was every day he came out and supplemented the animals either with a control, which was dry distiller's grain uh, supplement, or with dry distiller's grain with smartamine. So here was the moon protecting the thiamine, which had 21.2 grams of smartamine in, plus 38.8 grams of dry distiller's grain. So he would supplement this every day to individual cows during all this time period, from 30 days in milk to 126 days in milk. So this was a way that we chose to try to change the methionine uh, concentrations in this study. And here's some of the things we measured. We measured quite a few things. You can imagine we AI'd in this time period, 61 to 68 days, after a double offsync protocol. We did uh, preg checks at, at 28, 32, uh, 33 days, we actually evaluated the size of the embryo, 47 days and 61 days. So we did a lot of pregnancy diagnosis uh, to try to evaluate this because that's what we're finding is that the methionine is having an effect on pregnancy loss. So I'll kind of show you how the results come out. The first thing is here's the size of the embryo. So we measured the amniotic vesicle. So this is the fluid that's around the embryo. And what you can see is the first lactation cows, there's really no difference between control and the animals that receive methionine. They seem to be uh, sufficient. But the, the older cows, the multiparous cows, have a significant increase in the size of the amniotic vesicle, up to where they're back to kind of normal 
or back to what the, the values are on day 33 for the permepris count. So it seems that the control cows are lacking some of the binding to be able to grow the embryo sufficiently. We also measure the embryo itself with crown lump length and abdominal diameter and the ellipsoid volume of the embryo. And kind of the same types of things. We really didn't have much of an effect in the first lactation cows, but we had quite a dramatic effect on some of these parameters, abdominal diameter and the volume of the embryo uh, when we supplemented, again, when we protected methionine. So we came back up to, to higher higher levels when we had room and protected methionine. Now here's one of the dramatic effects that we saw. We did uh, all the pregnancy diagnoses at these different times, and what we found is pregnancy loss was significantly reduced, again, in the multiparous cows. We had about 20% pregnancy loss in the controls, and we reduced that to about 6% in the animals supplemented with room protecting the thiony. And uh, between 32 and 61 days, uh, the same kind of uh, significant effect. So again, we seem to have an effect of rumen protective methionine on, on pregnancy loss in multiparous cows. We're currently in the midst of repeating this in a, in a study that's in collaboration with, um, with the group at Cornell University. And so we'll see if this continues to, uh, to be the case, but it seems to be pretty interesting that the animal requires uh, this rumen protective methionine uh, for having uh, a lower pregnancy loss. So again, just to summarize this, uh, we want to improve the nutrition in this dry period, such as vitamin E can be lacking sometimes, particularly herds maybe that uh, think they have enough vitamin E because they're just grazing animals. Uh, also lower energy uh, can, um, or in, in not the high energy dry period diet. So during these last three weeks, there seems to be some impact. Uh, during this early postpartum period, the first three weeks after calving, if we can reduce postpartum body condition score loss, it seems like that's going to be quite a positive for the embryo. Uh, actually, just by day seven, it's already having an impact if we, uh, if we have a lot of body condition score loss. And during this one week before a AI seems to be really a critical period for hormonal effects, and also for nutrition, I think we're also having some effects where we might be able to lower the NFC during this time period, maybe increase the polyunsaturated fatty acids, and we might be able to have some impact on fertility during this time period. And finally, uh, we should optimize the amino acids to reduce pregnancy loss, and we've, we've looked at that actually just with uh, methionine at this point. So I want to thank you for uh, the chance to be able to talk to you today. I'll take any questions this time. Okay. Thank you very much, Milo. That's a lot of uh, really great information. Um, I have a question for you. Um, okay. We were talking about uh, vitamin E supplementation, and I think your your focus was on the like the close up dry um, cow or dry cow period. I was just wondering, do you um, think there's a, a, a benefit also? For the vitamin E, or, or a, a role that vitamin E deficiency might play, even in the um, far-off um, dry cow um, group, or is it is the main focus there in the close-up group? Yeah, I'm just going to go back to that. Yeah, I think I think there is an effect. I, I think this is really a a deficiency, though, Kathy, because I think in the dry period on the three herds we were working with. They were, they were on pasture, and they weren't supplementing enough. And I think other people do also because some of the calculations for vitamin E are inaccurate for what pastures are going to provide. And so I think it's more of a problem of an, of an inadequate rather than maybe an effect of, of um, you know, going to excesses. And so I think in general in most of our diets in the U.S., we're going to have vitamin E at pretty high levels during the postpartum period and during uh, this other period. I'm not saying that it wouldn't have an effect if we aren't uh, at the right levels, but I think in general we're not deficient, except for maybe during this early time period, maybe because they aren't 
consuming quite as well. Maybe we're, we're a little bit low in vitamin E. It uh, does look like we're a little bit low in alpha tocopherol levels during this time period. So there may be some effect. Actually, uh, what you're seeing might have some, might be correct. So I think vitamin E does have an impact. Uh, but again, it's, it's an impact of when it's deficient, the immune system really um, doesn't work quite as well. So I think if there's any deficiencies, yeah, we should supplement vitamin E. But I don't really think going to excess levels to try to get some of the antioxidant effects of vitamin E are really going to have much impact. That's what okay, so, so making, like. making sure the diets are balanced and for recommended levels is, is, the, is the key key part. Here. Yeah, because really in the dry period, you should be having 1,000 IUs. And those herds were between 280 and 480 IU. So they were they were too low. And again, that's because they were calculating that the pastures would be providing a lot of vitamin E and it just didn't seem to be happening at the level, at the amounts they thought. And I don't know if that's in general, but other people are going to have the same types of problems. But, but that seems like that's a, um, yeah, that seems to be what's happened. So it's really just getting them up to the normal levels. And, and again, we had I had the alpha tocopherol levels there. You can always measure that in in the animals, but you're supposed to be getting up into that, uh, you know, above two and a half micrograms per mil of, of uh, alpha tocopherol, uh, and really a little bit above that. And and so we're if they, if we measure that in our animals and we're kind of low, then yeah, we need to put more vitamin E. But in general, most herds I think are okay, but may not be in the dry period. I'm kind of worried about some herds during the dry period that don't supplement sufficiently. Okay. Um, you also mentioned the, um, the effect of uh, higher um, non-fiber carbo carbohydrates and having a negative effect on fertility. You mentioned um, some speculation on the elevated... Well, it, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. No, no, go ahead. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Okay. You, and then you mentioned... Um, speculation on um, having elevated levels of insulin, and I just wondered how those elevated levels of insulin would have an impact. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. We've done two manipulative studies where we've, um, where we've, we've worked with that, and um, one of them we did some differences in feeding, and the other one we did, we actually did propylene glycol uh, every Actually, four times per day, we drenched them with propylene glycol during that one week before before AI to try to raise insulin. And we got a pretty dramatic increase in insulin and had, um, in that particular study with the propylene glycol, we had quite a dramatic effect on fertilization, which was kind of odd to us. Uh, most times, the only effects we've had on fertilization in previous studies has been when we have heat stress. Heat stress really reduces the fertilization by an effect on, on the oocyte. But high insulin may be affecting the oocyte. But in the other study where we did some, some changes in feeding, um, that was an effect on fertilization, but there was also an effect on the early embryo development after, yeah, I mean, we didn't keep the insulin high during early embryo development, but uh, that, that pre-AI period, and effects on embryo development. So I think insulin is probably impacting the follicle and the oocyte and maybe impacting its ability to be fertilized and potentially its ability to, to be able to develop after that time. And there's some, some other studies, uh, some pretty good studies in sheep, but some other studies in cattle that would be um, consistent with that, that, that elevated insulin seems to impact the, the oocyte and the, the follicle. So. I think, yeah, I think that's where we're at. It's, and it's probably really a focused time period when insulin is a negative. Probably if you go earlier than that, it may actually be a positive for growing follicles and things. But it's just during that last week when we seem to be having a, a negative impact on the oocyte. Okay. Well, thank you very much for um, yeah. expounding on that. Yeah, um, it's kind of a, a long story, but it's, it's actually been worked on a lot with, with human uh, impacts on human medicine because of of um, the diabetes kind of epidemic we have in the in oh. the human population and and that and that some of the effects of that on fertility.